We are now back on track, and it's time to welcome Rich Carmichael. Um, we've asked Rich to do the impossible, and that is to give two presentations, each of which could probably be 40 minutes long in one 40-minute period. And I have great confidence that he can pull this off because he was able to explain Larry's slide to us in just 30 seconds or less. So uh, Rich is uh, from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's obviously been an active participant uh, so far. He's going to talk about implementation and effectiveness of captive brood stock uh, for conservation of threatened spring Chinook salmon in the I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Grand Ronde River Basin in Oregon. And then he's got a second um, study he wants to talk about, assessment of population productivity, abundance, and life history response to supplement, uh, supplementation, again, of Chinook salmon in the Imnaha River in Northeast Oregon. Please welcome Rich Carmichael. So first I want to thank Amy and Larry for the invitation. Um, I sort of was a fill-in, but now I guess I feel like I'm part of the, part of the meeting. Uh, I've really learned a lot and I'm really struck by the similarity and the challenges that we faced 15 years ago where we had really some very similar decisions and that we face still continually today because we're still uh, still trying to manage some really severely depressed populations in Northeast Oregon. Um, as the introduction indicated, I'm going to try to rip through two, two presentations. Try to get through two presentations in 40 minutes. And the first one's going to be focused on a captive broodstock program we've been operating for Oh, about the past 15 years, and then the next one will be a long-term supplementation evaluation program. The outline for the presentation it looks like this. I'll present a little bit of a background um, regarding natural population status, some of our early hatchery efforts in the Grand Ronde Basin, and then some policy influences that forced us to make some major hatchery reform in the system. Talk about management goals and objectives, specifically our captive broodstock program goals and objectives. And then I'll go into a fairly detailed description of our rearing program, similar to what you saw for the coho captive brood that was presented earlier. And then I'll address uh, rearing program performance. Sorry, um, the air, if you speak at it from the side. And it blows blow, by. Not blow air directly in it, I think that's the trick. And then I'll turn it up. So just don't be too close. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about rearing program performance. So actually the performance of our PAR two adults in captivity and then captive offspring performance. So how did the offspring of our captive brood perform? A little orientation. Uh, this work takes place in Northeast Oregon, at least that's where the populations exist in the Grand Ronde Basin. There's actually six Chinook TRT identified populations in the basin. It resides about 800 kilometers from the ocean, and there are eight main stem dams and reservoirs on the Columbia and Snake River uh, between the Grand Ronde Basin and the ocean. Um, headwaters originate in the Blue Mountains at about 6,000 feet on the west side, and the Eagle Caps at about 11,000 feet on, on the east side of the basin. And Primarily, what I'll be speaking about today are populations in the Upper Grand Ronde, Catherine Creek, and uh, the Lostine River. A little bit of demographic history. Uh, the pop populations were really once quite abundant as recently as the 1950 and 1960s. And from the mid-1970s to the 1980s, we saw very precipitous declines in all three of these populations here. And those declines were primarily attributed to construction of four, uh, and operation of four new Lower Snake River dams, uh, lower, lower Monumental, Little Goose, Ice Harbor, and Lower Granite. In response to those declines, a uh, mitigation program was implemented in the early 1980s, and 
that was really kind of a traditional mitigation program. It sounds very similar to the way the Iron Gate program was originated. And these were the original goals, and they're real typical for most mitigation programs. Uh, smoke production goals, adult re return goals, and <clears throat> particularly important was maintaining endemic wild populations of Spring Chinook in the Minam and Wanaha rivers. <clears throat> so I'll speak a little bit about that as we move through the presentation. A little bit about the history of the performance of that early program. Uh, so I pointed out a steady decline in abundance since the late 1950s and in response we initiated the Lower Snake program. It was a traditional hatchery approach in the Grand Ronde in the early years and we used a non-local uh, domesticated stock for the program. It was actually called Rapid River Stock and it was a stock developed from fish that were blocked access to the Upper Snake River at Hell's Canyon Dam. We began hatchery supplementation in, with the 1982 cohort using the Rapid River hatchery fish and extensive outplants occurred at all life stages, par, smolts, and adults, particularly into Catherine Creek in the upper Grand Ronde. And actually hatchery fish comprised over 50% of the spawners in most of the populations, including the Minam and Wanaha, which were to be managed for wild fish sanctuaries. We initiated a comprehensive evaluation program from the beginning in 1984 and have been tracking the progress of this program and others all the way through implementation. Here's a little bit about the early program summary. Using the rapid river stock allowed us to achieve smolt production goals quickly. We had very poor smolt to adult survival rates well below our goals. We never returned enough adults to open any fisheries for recreational fishing, and tribal fishing was very restricted. Hatchery fish strayed extensively into the Minam, Wanaha, and Lostine rivers, and in some years actually represented over 80% of the spawners in those streams. And the natural population status remained severely depressed, and our supplementation efforts had failed, as shown by poor recruits per spawner and low abundance of natural spawners in our supplemented populations. Two really important policy things happened. Uh, in 1990, ODFW adopted Oregon's wild fish management policy, which provided very specific guidelines on the proportion of natural spawners that could be non-local origin fish. And then in 1992, these populations were listed as threatened uh, in the Grand Ronde and Naha MPG under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And it was clear to us that the way we had been operating our hatchery program was generating outcomes that weren't consistent with the wild fish policy guidelines, with endangered species recovery, nor sound conservation principles. We were faced with some decisions to make, but before we could make wise decisions on hatchery reform, we had some important questions to answer. And these are the questions here that we addressed. What was the demographic demographic status and near-term extinction risk for the populations. What genetic effects had resulted from prior releases and straying of the non-endemic hatchery stocks? And did there remain any genetic differentiation between the natural populations and between the hatchery fish that had strayed and spawned and the natural populations? With regards to demographic status, this is a time series which shows peak escapements for these three populations in the 60s relative to performance uh, natural origin spawner abundance in the 90s. And as you can see, we suffered some really prolonged periods of very low natural spawner abundance in these populations. Um, and actually in this three year period, in all cases, the populations had dropped below 50 individuals. Looking at a productivity measure in terms of spawner to spawner natural origin recruits, we have a fairly long time series here in the 80s where we're actually well below 0 0.5, so less than a half for all three populations. And across this whole time series, as you can see, in no case did we actually reach replacement. So in conclusion for that early time period and for our assessment of uh, where we should head with the program. Prior supplementation had failed. 
extinction risk was very high based on population growth rates, natural or origin abundance, and the low productivity that we had observed. There remains significant genetic differentiation between the hatchery and natural populations, um, including the Minam, Wanaha, Upper Grand Ron, Lostine, and Catherine Creek. And this was somewhat of a surprise to us, but what it really told us was that those hatchery fish that had been spawning in nature had very little reproductive success, and there wasn't much indication of intergression between those hatchery fish and our natural populations. Hatchery programs using endemic brood stock should be started immediately in Catherine Creek, Upper Grand Ronde, and the Lostine River, and we should leave the Minam and Wanaha as wild fish sanctuaries and reference streams for future years. These are some of the adaptive management hatchery reforms that we took. We eliminated releases of the non-endemic stock. We initiated captive brood stocks with collections of PAR in 1995. We began a conventional supplementation program in the late 1990s in the Lostine River and a couple of years later in Catherine Crick in the Upper Grand Ronde. And I'm really not going to speak to that today except for to use some of the data from that program to assess the performance of our captive broodstock program. We constructed acclimation and adult capture facilities on those three rivers and we made significant modifications to the central rearing facility, which was Looking Glass Hatchery, to move from a one-stock management program to a three-stock management program. And then again, we uh, decided to maintain the Minam and Wanaha populations as unsupplemented reference streams. The specific objectives for our captive broodstock program were to prevent extinction of the native Catherine Crick, Lostine, and Upper Grand populations, maintain genetic diversity in the wild populations in the Minam and Wanaha, provide a future basis and methods to stabilize abundance and assist in high probability of population persistence until the key causes of decline could be addressed. And really for these populations, um, the primary limiting factor are main stem hydrosystem survival to, to and from the ocean. And then some of the tributary habitat is quite severely degraded. Our specific targets were to produce 150,000 smolts annually to return 150 adults to spawn naturally in each stream. We had an extensive monitoring and evaluation program um, and we set this up as an experimental program. So the first to monitor, assess, and compare the effects of pre and post smolt rearing treatment so that's two rearing treatments from par to small. One is an accelerated growth and one is a natural growth profile. And then to take the smolts to two types of smolt to adult rearing facilities, one in seawater and one in freshwater. Develop and evaluate the effectiveness of innovative methods of rearing. Monitor and assess the performance of captive brood offspring. Um, and monitor and compare aspects of life history and production performance between captive and a conventional supplementation produced fish. And then lastly, assess our success in achieving the conservation goals and production ben benchmarks. I showed you a, 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 a map of the whole basin before. This just highlights the locations where we collected our PAR for our captive broodstock program in the three populations, the Upper Grand Ron, Catherine Creek, and the Lostine River. The method we used is to collect wild PAR using uh, snorkel sanding techniques. Uh, this is the adult rearing container here at Bonneville Hatchery. We actually reared fish at Bonneville and Manchester Marine Lab, Bonneville being the freshwater and Manchester being the seawater facility. And this is one of our adult female uh, mature captive brood <coughs> fish. This shows the sort of the life history trajectory. So we collect par throughout the distribution. We rear to smolt under a natural and accelerated rates. Post-smolt rearing is in freshwater and saltwater. We obviously spawn only within stocks and treatment groups. And we rear the offspring to the smolt stage in our traditional manner of production of smolts. We release in the parents 
streams and we only allow the returning adults to spawn naturally. We don't use any of the returning adults for broodstock. <clears throat> Let's go to the captive broodstock results. So before we started the program, we actually established targets for all the performance uh, categories and so our target was to collect 500 fish from each of the populations each year and we were able to do that with the exception of the Grand Ronde which had extremely low abundances in some years and we weren't able to meet our goal. We assumed a sex ratio of one to one and it approximately was one to one. We had hoped to achieve similar growth to what we see in our naturally produced fish and actually our growth was much slower and I'll show that and we produced fish that were quite a bit smaller than uh, free-ranging ocean fish. Our survival rates for part of smolt and smolt to adult and overall actually were equal to or exceeded what our original goals were. Age at maturity, if you look here, this is the expected value that we had planned on and then this value here is the actual. So for females we actually had a, a very similar pattern of age at maturity to what our natural fish mature at. For males we had a much younger age at maturity. For example we get very few age 2 mature fish and we had 20 percent in our captive brood and actually 69 percent age three, hardly any fours and fives, and in our natural population, most of the fish are uh, threes, fours, and fives. Spawn timing, and I'll show a graph of this, is our ex natural spawn timing is August and September. This spawn timing was actually delayed by a full month. Um, fecundity was far less for our captive brood than um, what natural is, so typically we get 4,000 eggs in an age 5 natural origin fish and for captive brood it was uh, about 1,600. As far as survival and disposition of fish, typically about 50 percent of the fish survived to spawning. It was lower than that in some years. These bars here illustrate the distribution of the fish and the causes for the actual fish that died. BKD was the predominant uh, mortality factor for our captive brood. Uh, in some cases we had other diseases that uh, were a problem. Unknown causes of mortality were significant. As I mentioned, generally we met our goal of about 50% survival to maturity and spawning. Spawn timing, this shows uh, natural origin spawn timing and Catherine Crick and this shows the spawn timing of our captive brood fish. So almost a full month difference in the, in the timing between natural origin and captive fish. When we look at the size of the females, as I mentioned, they're quite a bit smaller for our captive brood. In the, in the blue uh, data here, we see the size of natural origin, natural origin fish and the stocks, Catherine Crick, Grand Ronde, and Lostine River. I'm not gonna go into detail on the freshwater uh, and accelerated and natural freshwater uh, marine environments, but I'll, I'll draw some conclusions at the end. But basically across all age, age classes for all stocks, we did not achieve nearly the size of the fish that we do in nature. Fecundity was far less in our captive fish, as I mentioned. Uh, we actually had somewhere between a third or a quarter of the eggs in our captive fish that we see in our, in our natural fish. So in summary for the captive phase, uh, we met our goal of 500 par per stock per year except for the Grand Ronde in those years that I mentioned. Captive brood fish grew much more slowly than our expected rate. And the saltwater group grew more slowly than the freshwater group. And the natural group from par to smolt grew faster than the accelerated group. Survival, part of smolt survival was above the 95% expected. Smolt to spawn survival was variable but slightly above the 55. And natural growth treatment survived better in salt water than the accelerated growth treatment. Sex ratio was one to one. BKD was our primary mortality factor. Males matured earlier, females matured a little bit later. Um, 
And then as far as spawn timing, captive fish are three weeks to a month later. Some of the most significant program challenges for the rearing phase of the program was growth of saltwater fish, which was slower than freshwater and way slower than natural. Low abundance of par in some years and our inability to collect 500 par from the Grand Ronde. High BKD mortality and high culling rates in, in eggs from high tighter BKD females. And then challenge, of course, if you wanted to use this program for outplanting adults, synchronizing maturation, and then early detection of maturing fish, particularly in saltwater, was a challenge early in the program. Let's go to the captive F1s. So I'd egg to smolt survival. Uh, very similar between captive and conventional. A little bit higher in these two years, but there's no statistical difference between the two across the stocks. Adult returns, uh, if you remember our goal was to achieve 150 annual adult returns from our smolt releases. And we achieved that in some of the years, but generally we were slightly below the 150 adult um, returns for, the, particularly for the Grand Ron, we, we did much better for, for the Catherine Crick. Of course, a large part of this was because we didn't achieve our par collections in many years. Small to adult survival rates. Generally, the captive fish survived above the original goal of 0.1%, so the captive is in the magenta color here. The blue is the natural origin fish, and the white is the conventional. Um, so they, they exceeded our goal, but they're always, almost always less than the natural origin fish, and generally the conventional fish survived a little bit better from small to adult than the progeny from the captive. Size at maturity of the F1 fish. No statistical difference between captive fish adults produced from captive than from conventional than from natural fish. Age composition. As we see with many of our hatchery programs, uh, generally the hatchery fish return at an earlier age, and we did see that with the Catherine Crick fish, both for conventional and for the captive, so we have far greater proportions of jack than the background blue, which is natural. Very similar proportions at age four and far less age five fish, and that's really quite typical. For Grand Ronde, we didn't see the same pattern. We actually had a little bit more uh, similarity between the captive and the natural and it, the conventional fish actually returned at an earlier age than the captive offspring. This is a modeling exercise we did to just <laughs> kind of show what sort of two life cycle benefits you might achieve by moving into a captive. So you start with 500 par in nature, 500 par in a conventional hatchery program, and 500 par in a captive, and you use the survival rates that we have, empirical data for the performance of these, and you follow them through adult returns and then offspring that return as adults as F1s. And so starting with 500 par for natural fish, we get one adult back. Um, for the conventional program, we would get 18. And then for the captive program, we would get 370 adults back from 500 par. So it shows a very substantial advantage to the captive program for producing adults back over a, a, basically a one and a half generation period. Uh, I did want to show sort of for Catherine Crick what the, what the response was for spawners in nature. So this is a time series that's sort of the pre-captive when we were really in a depressed level and then we've added captive brood uh, adults to the natural spawning population. And you can see we've actually increased the spawners substantially. But be aware, if you look at the reference population, it's also showed a significant increase in abundance too and that's just a natural response. So there's, there's a lot more going on than just addition of captives. There's improved survival to the ocean and improved ocean conditions involved also. So summary and conclusions for the F1 generation. Egg to smolt survival better in the conventional program. 
We rarely achieved our smoke production for the captive broods, mostly because of BKD and culling. Uh, our adult returns often met the captive brood goal. The SARs met captive brood stock goal, but they were lower than conventional and natural. Size at maturity for the F1s were similar across all the programs, including natural. H comp was similar um, between the programs, but younger for natural. Run timing was similar. We didn't see differences in run timing. And spawning distribution, what we've seen, and I didn't show that data, is that our hatchery fish tend to spawn in a more concentrated area near the acclimation facility where they're acclimated and released. So, in conclusion, captive brood stocks can be used to rapidly increase numbers of returning adults. Growth and fecundity are slower and lower. Disease and culling are a significant challenge for Chinook. I don't think you'd have quite the challenge with coho. F1 performance is slightly poorer for, for the captive offspring than conventional. And there's quite a bit of debate and, and uncertainty about the relative genetic risk between the captive broodstock program the way we operated it and a, and a conventional hatchery program from the amplification of genes from a small number of parents and unequal family contributions. We've discontinued our captive broodstock programs with the exception of the Upper Grand Run Safety Net Program, and that's a program we're just hanging on to and not planning on using unless we actually have to, unless we get down to those really low levels again. But our populations are up to a point where we can actually operate our conventional hatchery programs get adequate brood stock and not have to rely on the captives. We also have been doing relative reproductive success studies uh, comparing captives, conventionals and naturals in Catherine Crick. And I'm just gonna go real quickly and show a couple of graphs so I can move on. So all of the performance in this relative reproductive success is standardized to one relative to wild fish. These are brood years 2002 through 2005. These are aggregated captive brood stock and conventional fish performance in Catherine Crick. And overall, the combined hatchery fish performed at about 82% relative to natural fish. So really, really a pretty good performance. Um, these are labeled wrong, so these should be 02 through 06, like the previous graph. And what this does is break out the captive versus conventional to just point out that there was pretty much consistent relative reproductive success between the captives and conventional. So the, the adults produced from the captive broodstock program perform equally to the conventional. Combined, they perform at about 80% of natural. You want to take questions now on this, this piece of How it? How am I doing on time? Uh, you're just uh, perfect, but... What do people want to do while while it's fresh? Okay, we'll, we'll take some questions now while it, it's fresh in your minds, but we will um, we'll move on so he gets his other pieces. Now this is kind of Craig Tucker isn't here, so you tell him that I was kind of supporting him on the question that he was asking yesterday. But uh, it, it kind of gets to the point of whatever program you use for supplementation, it involves in some other kind of selection that doesn't occur in nature and. Michael Lacey mentioned one of the concerns about any um, uh, supplementation program is the relaxation of selection. And so here in, the, um, in your captive brood scenario, the, the selection process that you're relaxing is ocean survival. And you know, they're missing a, a, a critical component of that life stage and to the degree that that, that survival in the ocean environment behavior, survival behavior is genetically encoded, are you not potentially selecting uh, for fish that are maybe a little weaker in the ocean environment? <clears throat> yeah, if there is significant, um, significant selection from smolt to adult, so, so that really has to do with how much of the mortality that occurs between smolt and adult, which is a lot, 99%. To what degree is that selective versus random? We don't know that. Obviously, there's probably some selection taking place. Uh, 
Um, for us, the, the issue was getting the demographic numbers up quickly to get us out of the hole, and that was a risk we were we were willing to take. Basically, my personal opinion is that there's probably more selection that takes place at the earlier components of the life stage and maybe during the adult return life stage than potentially at, at the smolt to adult life stage. Although we do have a very unnatural environment for smolt migration, a lot of these fish are loaded on barges and transported all the way from the first dam they hit to below the eighth dam um, in route to the ocean. So. Um, I, I don't know how much selection is going, go, going on, but we were willing to take the risk of that. And recognizing that we weren't going to bring any more of those fish back into breeding and captivity, and the only place that they were going to go was into nature, and that we would force another natural selection on them just after one cycle in the hatchery. Thank you. Any other question that if you don't ask it now, you're going to lose it? before the next Q&A period. So why don't we go ahead then to the next presentation. So basically the next presentation is an assessment of a long-term supplementation program that's been going on since the early 1980s and a presentation of some what I believe are some really innovative analytical approaches and uh, necessary approaches for really assessing the success of these kinds of programs. Brief outline, uh, management objectives and comp compensation goals for this hatchery program for the Amnaha Spring Summer Chinook program, what our monitoring and evaluation objectives are, a little history on broodstock development and management, assessment of supplementation effectiveness, and then wrap up with some conclusions and future challenges. Similar slide to the one I showed before, this is the Amnaha Chinook trajectory from the early 1950s to current. And as we saw with the Grand Ronde populations, a pretty precipitous decline from the mid-1970s until, um, until the 1980s. As part of the construction of the Lower Snake River Comp dams, the Lower Snake River Compensation Plan was adopted and hatchery programs were put in place and one was put in place for the Imnaha River Basin. These were the, excuse me, the goals. 490,000 smolts, although we dropped that to an interim goal of 360,000 because these fish are also produced at Looking Glass Hatchery and with the complexity we added with the captive broodstock programs and the other local programs. We didn't have the space for the entirety of this program. That goal was supposed to produce 16,000 adult returns to the Columbia Basin and actually 3,200 annually to the Imnaha. The Imnaha Basin is located just upstream of where the Grand Ronde is. It's a tributary to the Snake. The headwaters are about uh, 900 kilometers from the ocean. We have an acclimation and adult weir here where fish are collected and, and we do our smolt acclimation. The rearing occurs at Looking Glass Hatchery. It's a typical Snake River production strategy where spring chinook smolts are reared for about a year and a half prior to when they're released back into their parent stream. Management objectives. Uh, establish an annual supply of broodstock. And one of the unique things for the Amnaha is from its inception, it was really visualized as a supplementation program. And, and the uniqueness of that population was recognized. It was a larger at return, a later running fish, and an older age at return fish than the Grand Ron stocks. And so a uh, decision was made basically to only use local broodstock from the beginning and to actually place even clear back in the in the mid 1980s some sort of uh, conservation and supplementation type objectives into the management objectives. One was to maintain and enhance natural production while maintaining long term fitness of the natural population and operate the hatchery program so we maintain the genetic and life history characteristics of the natural population. Mm -hmm. 
and have hatchery fish mimic, the, mimic those characteristics. And these are the two management objectives that I'm going to focus on primarily in my presentation today because they're most relevant to this, to this uh, workshop here. We have a whole suite of monitoring and evaluation objectives including traditional things like rearing and release strategies, characterizing survival, catch and escapement distribution. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those, but I am going to talk about assessing and comparing the recruits per spawner of hatchery and natural origin fish. So how much full life cycle advantage do we get by bringing hatchery fish into, uh, excuse me, natural origin fish into the hatchery? Assess the response in the natural population abundance and productivity in terms of adult spawners to spawner to the supplementation program and then assess and compare life history characteristics like age structure, run timing, sex ratios, fecundity of hatchery and natural fish. This is the weir we operate on the Amnaha. Um, placed into the river whenever we can get it in, which I'll point out is a significant problem and challenge for the program. This is looking glass hatchery, so adults are transported to looking glass hatchery. They're held, they're spawned there, incubation occurs there, reared to smolts, and then transferred back to this acclimation facility. <coughs> they're typically released in, in mid April. We manage the Amnaha on a sliding scale broodstock management, and basically, what the sliding scale does is provide sort of uh, demographic and production balancing and risk balancing. So when we have really small escapement levels, um, we have a more, basically a more aggressive hatchery program. So the proportion of the natural origin fish that return to the weir, you can, you can take a higher proportion when you have a lower escapement. Um, the percentage of hatchery fish that are released to spawn naturally above the weir, and when I say percentage, it's percentage of the total fish released, is higher at lower escapements and then gets lower as we get higher escapements. So the hatchery fraction goes down as our total escapement goes up. And then the minimum percent of natural origin brood stock in the total brood stock that are spawned is lower at low abundance levels and then that increases as we we go over. So we manage this program with this sliding scale concept. A little bit about the broodstock history. program was started in 1982. Only Amnaha River fish were used. So from 82 to 88, most all of the fish were natural origin. Then significant numbers of hatchery fish started coming back. So the proportion of natural origin broodstock varied considerably in, in this uh, this four-year time frame right here. And then in recent time frames, we've actually had a, a lower proportion of natural origin broodstock because the numbers of natural origin fish have been down. Um, and the program sort of managed duly to meet the production goals and to try to meet some of the supplementation evaluation and uh, production objectives. If we look at what's going on with natural spawners, um, Basically from 1982 82 to 88, most all of the fish spawning in nature were natural origin fish. As we move forward in time, that number is highly variable for this four year time frame. And in, in the recent time frame, it's been about 50 to 85% hatchery fish in nature. Uh, percent retained for broodstock has generally been below 30 for this whole time frame. And people talked about PNI yesterday. We had a really high, obviously a high PNI in the early part of the program. It was highly variable in this time period here. And in recent years, the PNI has really been quite low. And I'll talk about that in a second. And that hasn't really been purposeful. It's been sort of uncontrolled. Um, this is a graph that shows the proportion of the Chinook trapped at the weir on an annual basis. So the weir goes in when conditions are physically allow the weir because it's a picket weir and we get really high water, sometimes clear through mid-June and physically you just can't put the weir in. And in some years that results in a substantial proportion of the fish passing the weir site before the weir goes in. 
And so what that does in years when you have high hatchery to natural ratios, it puts a lot of hatchery fish on the spawning grounds above the weir, um, fish that we can't control their escapement. So even though we have that sliding scale to try to achieve a 50-50 or a 60-40, uh, we don't achieve that in many years because we're not trapping across the entirety of the run. Shows the history of smolt releases, just to indicate that since uh, the early 2000s, we've been pretty much achieving our smolt production goal of 360,000. This shows smolt to adult return rates and smolt to adult survival. We, we, ident uh, we identify SAS as total survival to adults, so it includes all harvest, all strays, where SAR is returned to the basin of release. And as I showed you before, we had a goal of 0 0.65 and really some pretty poor performance in the early part of the program, but we've actually been exceeding or achieving our um, SAR goals in recent years. This shows recruits per spawner comparisons between natural and hatchery fish, so the natural in the blue and the hatchery in the white. And it's really just to illustrate a couple of things. Through this entire time series, we've had very few years with uh, above replacement for natural spawners. Really a high survival advantage for full life cycle for the hatchery program. I think it's about 10 to 1, so we're getting about on average 10 times as many adults back for fish we bring in the hatchery than fish we leave in nature. Run timing of hatchery and natural origin fish, as I mentioned, we get the weir in late and that's really manifested itself in run timing comparison. This is just one year, but if you look at averages across all the years, basically, um, hatch hatchery fish arrive much later to the weir than natural origin fish. Um, this, this, these blocks out here where hatchery fish are arriving about an, on average two weeks later. If we look at spawning distribution, we see something similar to what I mentioned for Catherine Creek where our hatchery fish are spawning lower in the system and generally um, around more centraled around the release location where, where the acclimation facility is. Although there is complete overlap in the range of spawning distribution, hatchery fish concentrate in this area here. Age at return, as we see in many of our hatchery programs, we get a much higher proportion of age three males in the hatchery and a much lower proportion of age five. Um, similar age four here, but way more uh, jacks in, in the hatchery component than we see in the natural origin fish. Total spawners in nature, um, and I'll talk more about this later, but basically we've seen a pretty, pretty substantial increase in the total spawners over time with the addition of all these, these hatchery fish that we've added to the program. So now I'm going to talk about uh, a method we use to assess abundance and productivity response of the natural population. And what we did is compiled spawner and recruit adult abundance and productivity time series for the Amnaha and unsupplemented streams in Idaho. And these streams in Idaho have to, basically they go to the same place in the ocean and they have to experience the same mortality factors of the eight dams and reservoirs at the Imnaha population. We determine the level of correlation in abundance and productivity between the Idaho reference streams and the Imnaha population for a pre-supplementation time period to see how well they would serve as reference streams to see what kind of synchrony there was in the pre-supplementation time period. And we have data sets that go back to the late 1950s uh, through 80, 1985 as a pre-supplementation time period for abundance and for productivity the pre-supplementation time period 1950 to 1981. We calculated and compared pre and post ratios of Imnaha to reference for total spawners, natural origin spawners, and productivity in terms of spawner to spawner. So these are the assumptions or, or premise I guess so if the program's being successful in supplementing the natural population, then 
total spawner abundance should increase, therefore the post-supplementation ratios of Imnaha to the reference streams should be higher than the pre-supplementation time period. Natural origin abundance should increase, so if we're producing more natural fish, the post-supplementation abundance ratios should be higher than the pre-supplementation ratios. And then if productivity doesn't change, basically we shouldn't see any difference in the pre and post-supplementation ratios. This just uh, shows the calculations basically that we did for those different metrics. A map that shows the location of the Amnaha, and then these are all the reference populations that we used in Idaho that are unsupplemented populations. And so the first step in the analysis is to do correlation to see if the reference streams actually can serve as reference. And basically what we found was um, in all cases, except in all cases for abundance, we have significant correlation and in many cases the um, amount of variation that's accounted for in the relationship is really quite high, 75, 67. And then when you look at the productivity and spawner, to spawner recruits per spawner, um, most of the relationships were significant with the exception of two, although overall the correlations were not quite as good as they were in natural origin abundance. This just shows you a time series. Um, the Amnaha is in the white bar in one of the streams that we used, Bear Valley Creek. So it shows a time series from 1960 uh, through 2009, I think it is here. So this is the data set. These are the data sets that we start with. Uh, this is a abundance of natural spawners. And then this is a productivity data set. And then basically we take those and we calculate brood year specific ratios. So this is a series of ratios for natural origin wow. abundance in the unsupplemented and supplemented time frame. So looking at the results of that, so first, the first question is, did we increase total spawners with our supplementation program? So if we look at the means of the, pre of the ratios for the pre-supplementation time frame, compare them with the post-supplementation time frame, look at the differences. Basically what we see are all of the differences are positive, which we would hope for and expect. Um, so all of them were in a positive direction, and some of them are statistically significant and some aren't. Generally, we would conclude that we did significantly increase the total spawner abundance in the post-supplementation time frame above what it had would have been had we not uh, entered into supplementation. If we look at natural origin spawner abundance, it's a much different picture. So again, we're comparing the pre-supplementation with the post. We look at the differences. Uh, what we obviously would hope to see here is positive values and significant positive values, but what we see is a mix. So we have a number of comparisons that are negative, some that are positive, and some that are statistically significant, but we have both positive and negative values that are statistical. So we conclude basically from this data that um, it doesn't look like we actually increased the natural origin spawner abundance in the post-supplementation time frame. Looking at the recruits per spawner, again, in this case, all of the values are negative, so they're all going down, and all of them are significant. So what this is indicating is in the post-supplementation time frame, we've actually seen a significant decline in productivity. One of the things that we've been asked a number of times, and I always ask myself is, could density dependence be the factor that's explaining the productivity decline that we've seen. And so this is a plot basically of the SAR adjusted recruits, so we're trying to standardize this to an average set of ocean conditions, and the pre and post supplementation, and the spawners, and the pre and post supplementation time frame. So if 
actually density dependence was the primary reason for that decline in productivity, we would expect most of these data points to be out here on the high end of the density, but actually they're not. A majority of the post-supplementation data points reside in moderate to low density areas and they reside below um, most of the points in the, in the pre-supplementation time frame. So I'll, I'll wrap up with some program performance summary. Hatchery or fish return at an earlier age. They return and spawn at a later date. Spawner distribution of females is more downstream than natural females and near the release location. Size at age and age specific fecundity are equal, but mean fecundity of hatchery fish is lower because their average age is lower. In terms of supplementation, we've achieved a significant life cycle survival advantage, about 10 to 1 as I mentioned. We haven't observed an increase in the number of natural origin spawners through time. Recruits per spawner for natural spawning hatchery and natural aggregate has averaged less than one and it's been above replacement only five times in the last 20 brood years. It doesn't appear we've increased natural origin abundance even though we've increased the total number of spawners and productivity of the natural spawning aggregate in the Amnaha population has decreased relative to what it had been, would have been had we not supplemented since we started supplementation. So why not more natural origin salmon and why does productivity appear depressed? Here's some hypothesis um, and, and sort of my take on what their relative likelihood would be. So could poor reproductive success of hatchery fish be the cause of the low productivity? And I think that's highly likely. Um, given literature values that we know in terms of hatchery performance, and we have a low PNI in the program, we've had selective broodstock collection, not on purpose, but just because of facility limitations. Um, and we've seen some life history differences between natural and hatchery fish. And when you look at all those factors, those could be impediments to hatchery fish performance in nature. Competitive and other ecological effects on natural origin juveniles. We don't have any data on that, so we're highly uncertain due to lack of information. But given that we produce 360,000 smolts and we release them right on top of the rearing area where the prior year juveniles are rearing natural origin fish, there is uh, some potential that that's, that's, that's a factor. Other genetic and ecological effects, likely given selective broodstock collection, high proportion of hatchery fish in nature, differences in spawn timing. One thing that we see because of uncontrolled escapement above the weir, uh, we're producing 30% of our fish as hatchery origin jacks and those jacks become a really high proportion of the spawners on the spawning ground, a very unnaturally high proportion of spawners on the spawning ground. Density dependent effects, uh, as I showed, I don't really think they're likely because many of the many or most of the supplementation years are low spawner abundance and even at the high spawner abundances, those uh, recruit per spawner value are much, much lower than what we saw for the pre-supplementation time frame. What are some of our program challenges? So immediately we're trying to get a better weir in so we can collect fish across the run and what that's really going to do is allow us to improve our PNI because we will be able to restrict hatchery fish in the natural environment to our sliding scale and it would be able to, if we can collect broodstock across the run, we should be able to bring the run timing between hatchery and natural fish uh, more into synchrony. The low productivity of natural spawners and low abundance of natural origin returns that limits our ability to improve PNI because it, li it limits the available natural origin fish for broodstock and it also limits our ability to access um, hatchery fish. I didn't talk about our recreational and tribal fishery management but basically we, we, we fish on a um, basically a, a margin above some minimal abundance threshold of natural origin fish and oftentimes that margin is really small and it doesn't allow us to access hatchery fish because we hit the natural origin impacts before we get to the hatchery fish. 
And then we need a better understanding of the factors influence productivity of hatchery and natural fish in nature. And there's one thing and, and that I kind of like to leave everybody with, and, and this has been said a number of times, but artificial propagation, I don't believe, uh, can serve as a cornerstone for recovery of depressed salmon populations. Recovery to healthy, sustainable levels can only be achieved by addressing the primary limiting factors through protection and restoration, high quality habitat conditions and natural process across the entire life cycle. And hatcheries can help you hang on to fish while things change, but they can't help you with productivity. And the natural environment is really what drives recovery. Thanks again, Rich. We do have time for some questions. Larry, we'll start with you. Rich, given what uh, has occurred in the, the uh, mainstream snake and the Columbia with spill and so on, and maybe some restoration stuff that's been going on in the Yamaha, what about uh, eliminating this program or just reducing it? Um, <clears throat> so so there's, there's biological considerations that come into play and then there's legal and tribal and political considerations. This is a mitigation program for the construction of lower snake dams and most of the co-managers really don't want the program to go away sort of from its original objectives. They still like it to fuel fisheries if it could. Um, we have, we are operating the program at a reduced level right now. We have talked about some other alternatives if we can't get the weir in and do some improvement to PNI and things like that and really do a better job of, of regulating ratios in nature, spawner escapement. Um, but at this point in time, the next steps basically are to, to attempt to get a weir that collects fish across the run, stay with the production goals that we have right now, um, hope that the productivity of the population improves, which we have seen some glimmers of hope with the court mandated spill that's occurred the last four or five years. It really looks like that may be providing substantial survival benefits to the natural populations and that fish that migrate down the river, in the river, when you provide spill and decent flow conditions actually survive better than fish that are transported. Uh, much of the data that we've had from the past for the benefits of transportation come from years when there's no spill and there's no flow and the, and the main stem warms up and you basically create conditions that are poor for survival for in-river migrants. And that's when transportation does really well relative to in-river, but uh, recent years with the corridor spill looks like maybe in-river migration is gonna be a way to really improve productivity. Eric, you have a question? Yeah, Rich, I was just interested, you had mentioned the high proportions, high numbers of jacks that had returned, and I was, I'm uncertain of whether the analysis, the adult abundance analysis that you show includes those, and if you just did a female to female uh, abundance analysis, would there be any difference in the conclusions? So we, in all of the, so I, I serve on the, did serve on the TRT and, and in all of the analysis we've done for productivity and abundance in that work for viability assessment as well as all of the work we've done here, it, jacks are eliminated from the analysis. And the reason we eliminate jacks is because in situations like this, you can have 35% of your spawners be hat in nature be hatchery origin jacks and that they really don't contribute much to the, to the productivity, obviously. And so it really gives you a false impression of your spawner to spawner productivity. It makes it look really bad, even worse than it looks here. And if you do it in female to female, you really don't get a different picture as long as you've eliminated the jacks. So because of the sex ratios are 55, 45, they're fairly consistent for the age four or five fish. Um, you don't get much of a different picture when you do females only. 
have time for maybe one more question, and again, Rich will be in the panel this afternoon, so plenty of time to talk. Okay, one more question. Question, <clears throat> is, is this the screen that's had the dam removal project this winter in Naha? No, um, there's no tributary dam on the Imnaha. Im, I don't know what, actually there's no big dam removals that have occurred recently in the Snake Basin. He keeps thinking about the Little White and Elwha. Elwha or Little White probably are one of the two you're thinking about. Okay, not part of the study. All right, um, you've been sitting for close to two hours now, so it's time for afternoon break. And then when we come back, uh, we'll have our wrap-up panel. Uh, what's it all mean for the Shasta? So you try to come back uh, in a little over 10 minutes.